How fantastic. How exciting to be with you all again, <laughs> folks. How are you doing? Michael here. Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, Rupert here. Uh, yeah, we've got a, a right grand evening stacked up in front of us. We've got, what, questions about Thornbrae Henge. We've got questions about our journeys to Anatolia, perhaps. Significance of numbers in stone circles. Donington walls, pits. Was it aliens? What did it? Gebekli Tepe. <laughs> Yeah, hengeform structures in the Czech Republic. How about that? Dry yeah. stone walling, alignments to the sun and moon in ancient monuments. Can't wait. There's loads of talking there points uh, to come up. Yeah, but uh, first off, I, I see know what we're gonna say, that, but we're, hey. there are almost 50 people with us already and uh, a lot wow. of names that I recognize in the chat already. Indeed. And one that I've never seen before. VC1 from Ireland. Hello to you, sir. Welcome. Hello, um, VC1. Who's VC1? You said, sir, you don't know. I don't know. No, I didn't. No, no. I, I do beg your pardon if I'm wrong. Um, so, folks we know who are here in the timeline, in the chat, uh, if you're new here and you've never been here before, uh, I'm Michael. He's Rupert. No, he's Rupert. <laughs> Like, yeah, uh, yeah, no, yeah. Once a month we, uh, yeah. once a month we uh, take the yeah. Well done. <laughs> once a month we uh, take time to answer fairly random questions that people have asked in the uh, in the last month. Uh, do our best. Yeah, to I told you, VC them. one's not a sir. Oh man, <laughs> no. I, my apologies. Yeah, my apologies. <laughs> do we have a Do we have a name? <laughs> Well, not yet. Okay. VC's being cryptic. Um, <laughs> yeah, do our best to uh, answer your questions, uh, you know, develop talking points, and uh, yeah, generally get to know you folks a, a little bit better out there. So, I think what can we say before we launch off? We mustn't uh, faff about too much. <clears throat> and what can we say? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> About this evening's proceedings. Indeed. Um, well, <laughs> we don't know what we're going to say, do we? We know what the questions are, but, um, you know, um, it's always interesting to see what comes out. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the most interesting thing for me, actually, is when somebody asks a left field question that is really interesting and not something that we just tend to think about for whatever reason, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we've got a couple of those tonight. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nick's just asking, did the fiber guys turn up? Nope. <laughs> Thank you for asking. But anyway, nope. still, we have a good clear signal. So uh, that's yeah. good. We're very happy about that. Um, mm. Yeah, for folks that don't know, I mean, we, um, uh, yeah, we're answering questions that have been asked in the, the last month or so. Uh, we'll uh, do our very best. I'm in England. Rupert's in, in France, in case uh, you didn't know. That's why we, uh, you know, have varying <laughs> levels of connection sometimes. <laughs> but it's abs Rupert's absolutely yeah. right. They're so great, these questions, because they do keep us on our toes, you know, and um, more often than not have us running away to um, um, uh, reference books and uh, past videos and things, just uh, checking up and keeping our grey matter generally, um, generally refreshed. So I don't think there's anything particular to relay um, right now. I think I will just before, because, you know, this is the last um, sort of public live before the new year. And especially, uh, uh, and it will be the, you know, last live thing we do um, before the new year. We've got our, our Patreon folk here as well in, in the chat. And um, that that is, I've been taking advice and I've been taking consultation with um, uh, an outfit in the US of A uh, uh, about how to develop uh, YouTube channels and, partic and in particular how to develop uh, our YouTube channel. Um, because uh, we, we do well, but it's the, we've, we've sort of leveled off a bit in, uh, in recent months for one reason or another. So what I'm saying is we don't know what they are, but look out for some changes of the way things are done in the new year. You know, obviously mm. we'll let you know how, how things go and, you know, 
um, what the thing is going to do. But I'm I'm really excited having talked uh, to um, this guy from uh, Video Creators. Uh, I'm very excited about the prospects of of the new year and how we can uh, Rupert and I begin can expand our audience you know reach the people um, apart from yourselves that um, you know are interested in this stuff and, and need reaching out to you know on some some levels we're not quite hitting it right and um, yeah. you know that that's what we intend to improve and engage with uh, in, in mm. the new year so uh, it's yeah. uh, it's one of the really tricky things and I will say publicly you know I, I uh... I am so uh, grateful to uh, uh, the way Mike's mind works on uh, on these things because the fact of the matter is that you know we both engage with with this whole field the way we do and it's it's actually really difficult to uh, you know to engage with making sure that the right stuff is on the channel and at the same time engage with everything that's necessary to actually drive the channel because yeah. it, it can so easily just get in the way of the work that you're trying to do you know you want to be researching and writing and filming and everything else but um, but there's no good uh, you know th there is little point if the channel itself isn't working um, so yeah it's that really yeah um, well, without further ado, ado I'm sure there'll be mention, more to mention <laughs> down the line uh, I think, yeah. though, first of all, we should uh, actually get on to answering a question. What do you think? I think we should. All right. First question up is from Jimmy, Jimmy Lawley. Jimmy, you're, you're great at, uh, at uh, asking questions. Regular <laughs> as clockwork, sir. Jimmy asks, uh, will we be returning to Thornborough for one of our Standing with the Stones 2 segments? Well, uh, really good question. Uh, question there's a couple of things to unpack there first of all <laughs> um uh, we need to explain about standing with stones too uh that in the way we envisaged it envisaged <laughs> in, it, it'll do it's a fine word the extra letter here or there is fine <laughs> it's it's not going to be happening in the way we thought I wonder, no. I wonder if they'll ever come up with an audio spelling correct so that while you're talking, it will just come up on the screen oh, with what yeah. you should have said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, mm. for one reason or another, we, we, we spent some time ex explaining that in, uh, in Patreon and, and, and elsewhere. But uh, Neil mm. Desperandum, uh, don't, don't despair because we do have plans to make a series of, of shorter films and... Jimmy, you're quite right. Returning to Thornborough would be a very good idea. Now, for those who don't know what Thornborough is, uh, Jimmy's referring to Thornborough Henge, is, uh, mm. which is a fantastic site in uh, Yorkshire. Three enormous mm. henges, uh, it, almost in alignment, but they're better than in alignment because they uh, coincidentally or deliberately, whichever, make your choice, uh, map out the, the way that Orion's belt appears in the sky. Um, mm. And two of the henges that are open now and are uh, visitable uh, quite easily are rather vestiges of their former self. Quite distinct in the landscape, but not quite as grand as they once were. However, hidden in a copse, uh, um, the northern one, is spectacular in the way it remains there. And I had my socks not completely knocked off when I paid a visit um, there uh, when I was doing an out and about um, thing for one of our prehistory shows. Was it last year? Uh, I can't remember. Um, no, it was this year. Well, I'm sure it was this year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, amazing. Um, actually, I think uh, if I look closely enough, no, I may have closed it. Oh, no, here it is. I'll put that in the chat because it's a link to the particular um, uh, prehistory show uh, that that appeared in. It's a, it's a segment. It's a it's a you know a segment in that show. However, Jimmy, yes, I think the answer is yes, don't you? Uh, the answer has to be yes. I mean, the, 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 for various reasons. I mean, as, you know, as Mike uh, has just mentioned, that apart from the fact that 
there is this uh, enigmatic correlation with uh, with Orion's belt. It does seem to echo uh, the pyramids on the Giza plateau, that sort of thing. Um, but the fact that the northerly hinge uh, of the group that's in the woods, uh, you know, that is <laughs> pretty. Sorry, sorry uh, to cut what? across. I... <laughs> What? Benjamin is Orion's belt a waste of space. <laughs> That's bad. You Carry on. Be. I'm so sorry um, I interrupted you laughing. That's um, have a chat while you're talking. Uh, but the the fact that uh, it, it's uh, it's less uh, leveled out than the others because it hasn't been farmed. It's been in the uh, it's been in the the woods. Uh, for thousands of years. So, you know, the, the ditch and bank still being a lot more visible, you know, it's, yeah. it, it, you know, we, we do need to go and explore it a little bit uh, and, and also explore it in relation to other sites in the surrounding landscape. I mean, people do talk about correlations uh, with, you know, so if it does, uh, it's, uh, if, if it is, What's the what? What on earth is the word I'm groping for here? If it is supposed to represent Orion, uh, and this is the belt, then you know there are people who say that there there are these other sites in the landscape that represent the other stars of the constellation yeah. of Orion. Uh, so you know we we do need to go and have a look at that and see you know were these people deliberately uh, marking things astrologically because. Uh, it's something that we have talked about, not an enormous amount, but we have mentioned it in the past, mm. that uh, in the main, it's not really known what the origin is of the constellations. You know, how far back into prehistory do they go? Because whilst we have Latin and Greek names for them, that in actual fact, there are correlations in many different cultures and different languages. There are correlations with some of the constellations that, you know, they go so far back into prehistory. Um, and oh, do you know what? I made a note of some, not for tonight. It was for something else that we were doing some research on. Can I actually uh, dig that up? It might be interesting. Whistle a happy tune for a moment. Um, <laughs> The point about going um, to, uh, you know, back to Thornbury is that there is such a lot there, um, but it's not much celebrated as a site. I mean, I, I think people know about it, but only on the most, usually, usually on the most superficial terms, because it is unique in its three, they are huge henges. In the, They're in enormous. The, they, you know, they are of, the uh, you know, national, you know, the, uh, biggest in Britain sort of size. I, you know, I, can't, yeah. I can't remember offhand where they would come in the list, but you're certainly talking about top 20. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they are com in complex landscapes. Uh, mm. I mean, there's an older uh, cursus than one of the hinges, you know, is, is sort of on top of a uh, an older cursus. And there are so many mm. ploughed down barrows and stuff. I mean, that's the problem with making a film mm. about these kinds of things, that they don't render well in the landscape. So it's hard mm. to make pretty pictures. And, you know, so yeah. it's it's got to be uh, um, uh, talking uh, heads. And, uh, I've, I've found drone this. Let me... Dronage. Dronage is, uh, is obligatory. Yeah. Let, let me just read you a couple of little bits here that I... Um, just a bit of research I did some time ago, but this was because of things that we were looking at mm. about astrology. So the Rig Veda, which is a, an Indian text, refers to the Orion constellation as Mriga, uh, which is called, oh, very good. Yeah, the two southern yes. hinges, and the northern one is in that. Uh, there in the woods, there. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. And this yeah. is the book of the excavation uh, of mm. Thornborough Henge um, and mm. uh, uh, Jan Hardy. Uh, so, yeah, it, um, <laughs> there is a, but the Rig, the Rig Veda refers to the Orion constellation as Amriga, which translates as the deer. Uh, it said that two bright stars in the front and the two bright stars in the rear are the hunting dogs. So this is deep in their culture. The one comparatively less bright star in the middle and ahead of the two front dogs is the hunter. 
and three aligned bright stars in the middle of uh, all four hunting dogs. Blah, 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 blah. I'll um, cut on. Then there is, um, uh, in old Hungarian, uh, Orion is known as uh, the magic archer or the reaper. Uh, so again, it still relates to uh, hunting. Um, there are some Hungarian references to it being called uh, Nimrod, uh, which was the greatest hunter. Uh, in Siberia, the Chukchi uh, people see Orion as a hunter. Um, uh, Old Deboran, uh, so that's the brightest star in Taurus, is supposed to be the arrow that he shot. Uh, so again, this is still Orion as a hunter. Just how far back does this go? Mm. Uh, the Seri people of northwestern Mexico call the three stars in the belt of Orion, Hapj, I don't know how you really pronounce that, H-A-P-J, uh, which is another name for a hunter. Um, and it, you know, the, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. It, it, it's astonishing how you get these cross-cultural correlations and uh, and you can't you know literally you no idea how far back these go um which yeah. i find that fascinating I really do jimmy your question was a simple one <laughs> and obviously <laughs> um <laughs> there is loads you know we could well do a number on uh, on thornborough hedge and we're close to doing one tonight um <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I, I think that basic question has been been asked. Uh, you're absolutely right. Whether it's talking about Orion or talking about the function of the hinges and their particular place in the land, and the fact that they're quite close to um, what's now the M1, which used to be, uh, which I can't remember the name of it. it used to the, what the name of the Roman road, which was probably over a you know, a sort of backbone of England road in the first first place. It was close to where people travelled. Hmm. Um, oh, we could go on. We could go on. Uh, we could. A couple of interesting comment, comments. Uh, Spike uh, says, uh, Norse, it's uh, the fisherman. Ah. Uh, which uh, he follows up, which is obviously the hunter of the sea. Hunter Absolutely. Sea. Yeah. Uh, it, it is interesting, isn't it? You know, mm. there's... Uh, so many correlations you know clearly so much was shared thousands of years ago mm. Um, mm. i'm going to move on to the next question yeah go on then. Uh, yeah. otherwise our mu musings will become vague and meandering if they haven't already yes, that wouldn't be the first time yoda's mum is on drugs are you there tonight <laughs> you said you're going uh -huh. to talk about anatolia in standing the stones too um are you guys, guys going to travel to Turkey's ancient sites for your own shots? That sounds like it may be expensive if you are. Uh, don't, mm. Well, are we going to travel to Turkey's ancient sites for our own shots? We wouldn't do it any other way. Um, no, we wouldn't. And we will yeah. be going to Anatolia, uh, for sure. Mm. Not under the guise of, of, of making Standing with Stones. And that's the wonderful thing about... <laughs> the wonderful thing it's one of the upsides of not making standing with stones too is that we you know we can begin to broaden the aspect of what we approach as the prehistory guys you know, because it's standing with stones we're sort of nailed to the thing of of dealing with megalithic sites but we can we can be a bit more broad in our approach so uh, in including you know this area around the beginnings of civilization, the beginnings of farming um, uh, in Anatolia. Uh, we can address that now, which is, is fantastic. I think it's an opportunity, actually, Rupert, to say what we need to say about how we're going to proceed with making these kinds of films. Obviously, we'll be turning up um, uh, and doing our question time and doing prehistory flash and, uh, and doing the podcasts and, and any other sort of desk-based things that we can do, talking into microphones and 
and, and, and doing this, but our hearts are so in filmmaking and, and bringing you to places that you wouldn't otherwise get to and, and you know, mm. uh, bringing you the, 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 the archaeology, bringing you what's known about these places on the ground. So our next plan... Um, because as you know, we well, probably don't. I don't know um, when we were going. When it was mooted that we were going to start Standing with Stones two, uh, we uh, created a, 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 um, a buy me a coffee campaign, uh, a, 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 into which uh, people were marvelously, you know, put, putting uh, donating funds to seed the beginnings of production of Standing with Stones two. As we're not doing that those funds are going towards the production of the next film. And our next film, the proposed next film that we shall make, will be uh, on in, um, in Brittany, Karnak, uh, Bay of Morbihan, Morbihan, all that. That is so much of an elephant in the room that we haven't really addressed yet that you know, we're looking forward <laughs> to doing that. And that will be mm -hmm. as early as it can be in the, in the new year. Yeah. So... That's how we're going to uh, fund our films. So the, the question brings up the point, sounds like it might be expensive if we are. Yeah, but, you know, not manageably expensive, expensive, but manageably yeah. expensive. So when the time comes, we will start to ask for the funding, you know, through the Buy Me A Coffee campaign to um, fund mm. the flights, hotels and, and that kind of thing that will uh, get us on the ground and, and making the film that we want to make for you. Hmm. Um, so, yes, yeah, I mean, it, it goes without saying, really, uh, <laughs> maybe with a dollop of arrogance thrown in there, but we're not interested in using anybody else's footage. You know, Mike's a genius cameraman, uh, and uh, together we, uh, you know, we think we put together pretty good films and so the notion of using somebody else's library footage or whatever that just turns us into kind of random journalists really which mm -hmm. uh you know i mean all, all right all due respect to journalists but that's not what we are mm -hmm. uh so uh yeah <laughs> well i think the thing is you know we bring you to the ground by by you experiencing our reaction to to the place it's being on the ground mm -hmm. is the whole thing about standing with stones I know I said, you know, we, we can't always be about megaliths, but it, it's it's being there. That's the important thing. It, it, um, talking about these places from a distance, because mm. they always surprise, always, mm. without exception. Mm. Isn't that our experience, Rupert? You know, it's it's always our experience. And, and also, um, we... Um, as you probably all know, you know, we, we shamelessly won't tow anybody else's party line. And if we don't agree with what the experts say, mm. um, so long as it's not from a position of wanton ignorance, but you know, if we don't agree with people, we will say we don't agree with them. And if we don't know, we'll say we don't know. And, uh, you know, we, we don't like the way uh, very often people put forward completely arbitrary theories just because they think they need to be saying something mm -hmm. you know where it's just more honest to say don't know mm -hmm. um yeah thank you for all your kind uh, comments folks uh, yes Ray yes and, thank you indeed and, Dale mm -hmm. and, uh, and stuff and for all your thumbs up and really appreciated mm. and really uh, get it anyway uh, on to the next one let's see done that one uh yeah we've done that done the odors mum is on drugs uh nathan nathan halsey uh why do <laughs> so many stone circles have nine stones here's a good mm. right like the blue touch paper away <laughs> you go rupert <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's as, okay as far as we're concerned uh it, it's all yeah. down to lunar cycle you've got um uh, you've got the 18.6 well if you're going to be picking 18.6 one year full lunar cycle and uh so you you have a lot of stone circles with 19 stones in the circle uh, which is clearly you know if it's 18.61 the closest you can represent uh that with is 19 stones and if you want to cut that in half 
just to make it, uh, you know, a more manageable circle, maybe for a smaller community or what have you, for whatever reason, then uh, then half of that is is nine stones. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it has to be, really. So, so both the nines and the nineteens uh, would seem to be representing the the full lunar cycle. Um, uh, as to the actual why did they want to represent the, uh, the the lunar cycle so much? Well, you know, you you look at farming throughout the year and the way even today uh, people farm by the lunar cycle and oh you know you can go through all manner of reasons for that but it it does seem perfectly reasonable really that Mm. they would have felt that the movement of the moon was an important thing to uh, Uh, martin before caledonia interesting hello martin uh, nine is the biggest single digit number that's assuming of course that they're using a decimal counting system Hmm. we've no idea uh, Hmm. uh, uh, if they had a a, decimal counting system very interesting you know you've opened a whole can of worms there actually martin thinking about it you know Hmm. we happily count up Uh, sorry uh, no it's all right i was just trying to think because you know if we're going to look at cultural correlations and this is where i'm sorry senior moment i'm not going to remember the details but i think i'm right in saying that uh, wasn't babylon uh based on base 60. oh oh something crazy yes i it's mean crazy like can you talk, um, think about <clears throat> exactly that that i think it was something in the back of my um, mind remembering I, I some think, of the, the counting bases are absolutely insane just uh, just bonkers but mm. um uh, but the, uh, I suppose an interesting thing is there, there must have been, because we were talking um, a, a couple of months back about uh, there was a group of uh, researchers had established that there was a a weight system that was in operation for a full 2,000 years that we know about mm-hmm. that was cross-cultural. So people could have come from Anatolia with this weight of bronze um or tin or or whatever and it would have been the same as uh, as the system that uh, was being used in britain uh or anywhere else you know they've found these weights that uh throughout all the places across the globe that they uh, and i'm saying across the globe because i can't remember the full extent of the research but it was wide um, and uh, and the discrepancy between the weights over 2,000 years and over 2,000 years of specimens, for want of a better word, the greatest discrepancy was 15%. Um, and if you're talking about, uh, you know, that amount of bronze, you know, then, uh, I'm, and I'm saying bronze, it could have been grain, I don't know. Uh, but that was the greatest discrepancy. Most of them were only, you know, within a five percent um, bracket. You know, now if you're talking mm. about five percent on a, you know, a large chunk of of whatever, you know, that's, that's nothing really. So, mm. so you know, if you, uh, I, I sound like I'm digressing, I'm not. I'm just thinking that, you know, Martin, you're you're mentioning, you know, well, was there a correlation of of number systems? Clearly, there was a correlation of weight systems, so maybe, don't know, don't know. In in many ways, you know, whatever system of counting they're using is irrelevant. I mean, it it represents, um, it's what it represents that's the important thing, not the the quantity, if you see what I mean. That's that's the important thing. Uh, VC1, uh, but loads of stone circles have a whole variety of numbers of stones. Absolutely, they do. And, <laughs> and that's... Um, uh, and <laughs> here's, here's the thing. They don't always have their original number. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to go so far as, you know... I don't know what the statistics are. That's a really good you know, point and a really good uh, uh, ask about what the... Uh, uh, statistics are about numbers of circles, uh, numbers of stones in circles, and do they cluster uh, round uh, particular? Um, well, I, I think the, the the thing that really matters within that is that 
stone circles clearly serve different roles uh, within different societies. So there are a lot of stone circles that do have this correlation with the lunar cycle. But equally, there are lots of circles that don't. It doesn't mean that the ones that do represent the lunar cycle are nonsense. It, it, it doesn't mean that at all. It's just a question of what their focus happens to have been. And there are, uh, there are a lot of stone circles where the theory is that each stone... Uh, I mean, I'm thinking, isn't the Merry Maidens one where, uh, where if you look at the different shapes of the stones, it has been hypothesized that, that they could actually re represent members of a, of a community. Was it mm. the Merry Maidens that they thought that? Because, you know, some are fat and short and some are tall and thin. And, yeah, well. uh, yeah it's possible. It's possible. I mean, it's obviously, it's unknowable. So it's nice mm. to toss the ideas in the ring. But, yeah. you know. I'd forgotten about Dulo's stone circle. Uh, what, being nine stones? Being nine stones, and all made of quartz. Big, big mm. lumps of white quartz. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it must have looked wonderful back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've only been there once. You haven't been there. I, I photographed it for Stanley Stones, obviously, and the mm. sheep in the field. Uh, yes, no, I, I went subsequently, but uh, oh, but certainly, uh, yeah, yeah, but certainly I, I hadn't been there at the time. Yeah, mm. that's true. Uh, that's right. I mean, Helen says circles keep getting rearranged. Not only that, they they keep getting restored. Yes, <laughs> by people who should know better. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, that's mean. <laughs> and uh, oh, what was it above um, uh, that day when we were filming Cornwall? It was we were above Men and Toll looking for the uh, nine maidens. Is it? Up, up yeah, there, and it turned out to be yeah. eleven. Or something, or it should um, have been eleven. Yeah. Oh, whatever. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. There's an interesting comment from Spike. There, Spike says Odin hung for nine nights. I'm afraid that I'm rubbish on Norse mythology. Uh, so what? What? Um, uh, what was Odin hanging for? Which nine one? out of every animal oh, sacrifices. Was Oh, okay. interesting! Powerful number. Yeah, there's more to this nine thing than. Uh, yeah, you know, there is. Just, yeah, yeah. There's some more research we're, for us may, to do. We're maybe making it a lot more complicated than it uh, than it truly. <laughs> yeah, is. maybe. Who knows? Maybe. I'm yeah. going to put the next uh, question up, Rupert. If that's Go okay with you. Uh, John, John, hi there, John. John Brooker, has anyone considered probing the chalk-filled pits at Durrington Walls with the same technology that is used for undersea seismology? Different frequency range, possibly, but same uh, method methodology. It's interesting you, you ask that question, John, because I, I don't know if you're aware, but the, the guy that discovered uh, the uh, pits around Durrington Walls is the same guy that's been um, uh, pushing forward has been basically in charge of all the seismology and the uh, subaqua uh, discoveries on uh, Dogger Bank, uh, namely Vince Gaffney, um, who we interviewed a, a while back. Uh, great guy, but uh, a good question. Uh, anybody, uh, does anybody not know about the, um, the, the pits around that have been discovered around Durrington Walls? There's uh, some people have actually mentioned earlier in the chat. There is actually a documentary on Channel Five, UK is Channel Five. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, don't go. Don't, um, <laughs> watch it tomorrow. Um, that is about. Of course, they do all the clickbait thing of saying Stonehenge. It's nothing to do with Stonehenge. It's not really. It's uh, kind of in the same neighbourhood, but it's Durrington Walls. Mm. Um, or an enormous circle, anyway, isn't it? Yeah. Around there. Um, they're actually, uh, it'll be interesting to see this documentary. Uh, I didn't even know it was coming out yet, but mm. um, uh, because they have made a recent decision to do a proper excavation, which is going to be amazing. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I mean, they probably, did, as it was Vince Gaffney that did that, then it's quite possible that they did use the same technology anyway, isn't it? Um, well, I think there's uh, two different aspects to it. I mean, the uh, it certainly was the pits were discovered certainly in the first place through radiometry uh, and uh, ground penetrating radar survey. 
which is not the same thing as used in uh, undersea seismology. However, if memory serves me correctly, and it may not be, however, um, I, I, I think in the early days, Vince set out with a gang to do this very thing. He set out with some seismological uh, instruments to one of the pits. However, he chose the wrong time of year, and the ground was frozen so hard. So they used this uh, instrument that you know, just bangs the, 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 the ground really hard, and they get a seismological uh, echo back. Uh, and they couldn't get anything because the, the ground was frozen. So I'm pretty sure the answer is yes, but without, uh, uh, without result. And... Uh, We'll be looking forward. And it, it may have been uh, undertaken since. Uh, who knows? I, well, somebody knows, but I don't. <laughs> mm. um, but it's interesting. It's the same guy. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Donington Walls, Pitts, uh, Dogger Bank. Uh, Vince Gaffney is your man. Mm. And he'll be on the uh, Channel 5 uh, program uh, tonight. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, starring in tonight it's the interesting thing about it you know being related to durrington walls and of course you know fair enough durrington walls is uh is um uh, happening at the same time pretty much as stonehenge and uh, and the pits that were dug around it are uh i've lost a word rupert at the same time <laughs> i kept wanted to say chronological but that's, that's Contemporary, contemporary Con with contemporary with uh, uh, Durrington Walls. So, whoever was at Durrington Walls and built it and living there would have been conscious or would have been responsible for the making of these pits. The the uh, immediately uh, everybody's gone off on the ritual and spiritual and uh, 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 and significant things. I, I'm much more down to earth with my thinking about. Uh, about this large pits in the ground, equidistant from the uh, um, <clears throat> base camp, as it were, base camp yeah. that, that diminishes Durrington Walls. It was a huge settlement, uh, yes. but you know what I mean. Uh, I, yeah, I mean we don't really need to go down the grumpy no. route. It's just uh, it, it just <laughs> there are so many practical reasons why you would want to dig some dig some large pits, um, uh, and you know, keep anything them at from a known distance. Yeah. yeah. Let that hang there. Because you don't want to fall, fall into those in the dark, do you, Bob? No, that's right. <laughs> but, it, but it could be anything. It, you know, it, if, do you know what? We don't even need to go there. Um, but uh, but to suggest that they're... Uh, we'll have you know, to one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we should, you know, maybe dedicate a show to it. But um, <laughs> like, to suggest that, you know, I mean, every time, ritual, ritual, ritual. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Lazzy, McLandrover, Matt. Hello, Matt. <laughs> Why do you think people go for a, it was aliens <laughs> hypothesis? The aliens <laughs> did it. Why do you think? think. Now, that, that's not a. That's a psychological question, isn't it? That's not a. Yes, that's, not a, that's more of an anthropological question than an archaeological one. Yeah, isn't it? Kind of. Uh, as animals, we, we are only... just so desperate to. Uh, to explain everything because that way you take the fear out of it if you explain what did it um i think one, one of the uh, one of the fascinating things about psychology uh through uh through the centuries is uh you know you look at people experiencing similar things and if they were very religious people then uh they'd say that it was angels uh, if they were suspicious on a different level, they'd say it was ghosts. If they were, you know, into the whole UFO thing, they'd say that it was aliens, you know. And it's just down to uh, how you want to interpret things to explain them for your own personal security. Uh, you know, as animals, we haven't changed a whole lot, have we, in thousands of years? Not really. Mm -hmm. Um and that is the, the curious thing, you know, this illusion that we're living in an age of reason and uh, recent events and uh, things have, have, have rather um, put paid to that. I'm afraid, you know, in in my mind. So you know, so we're 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 doing our best to keep people's uh, feet on the ground uh, here. Um, but we do try. I, I, I think I mean, it's fair fair dues to people. I mean. I can't 
you know, be judgmental or anything like that. It is the easier answer. Or, or people prefer open-ended answers. Uh, and I think are under the illusion that you know scientific answers or uh, are open and are, are are fixed and immutable, and they're not. That, Permission to go off on one. Yes, go 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 away. Um, well, in <laughs> wearing my other hat um, as a naturalist, hmm. uh, some years ago uh, I was doing a lot of research on communication in the natural world. And uh, there are certain things that come up. Uh, so, for example, with ants and, uh, and wasps or ants and bees, uh, which are, they're, they're in the same order. They, you know, they've evolved from, uh, uh, from the, the same order. And, uh, uh, you know, and like every other organism on the planet, pheromones are a fundamental part of the communication system. Uh, now, in, uh, in ants, there is a pheromone, so a complex molecule, it's a molecular compound, that means um, come here and fight. And to bees, it's exactly the same molecule, and it means come here, there's food. Uh, and uh, and so you know the, the thing is that you have this uh, this molecule that is used by different species, um, but means different things to them. Now, one of the really fascinating things is that there are a couple. I say a couple. I actually think it's about fifteen uh, pheromones that are used by every species on the planet. So, uh, so you will be uh, sharing an aspect, however subtle, you'll be sharing a chemical communication factor with a beech tree or anything you like. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this is that something that I think we should never lose sight of is the fact that everything gets processed in in this this thing in here that's trapped inside a black box and it relies on its external you know its mates its external sensors whether it's our five senses or if you want to get into the you know maybe we're sensing things through the body and blah it doesn't matter the point is that the thing that's doing the processing to actually deliver that final decision on the information received, that's trapped in a black box. And so the way each of us interpret uh, different stimuli is going to be utterly subjective, okay, within parameters, but nevertheless subjective. And I profoundly believe, I've had experiences myself when I've been out in, uh, in the wilds, where under any stretch of any other uh, context, you'd say I've had an experience where there were fairies around and things like that. Uh, I've met lots and lots of people who believe that they have seen fairies and they've experienced this, that, and the other. Angels as well, if you like, I don't mind. But I think that what's happening is that when people go for a walk in the woods, lots of you might have had this experience, and you feel like you're being watched, for example. I think that what you're sensing is pheromones coming from the trees or whatever else around you. Now, because you use that pheromone yourself, that it's something that you recognize. So your brain automatically starts interpreting it as something that well, you normally get this when you're with people. Um, but you're picking it up uh, from uh, other organisms around you and your brain is just trying to interpret it and make sense of it in a different way. Uh, so um, do you see what I mean? Uh, so I'm saying, uh, you know, it was aliens. Well, <laughs> you know, the thing is, it's this thing in here just trying to make sense of stuff. Um, and sometimes it does a bad job. The meaning making machine. Uh, mm. It's its job. It's the, mm. it's the, the brain's uh, job and the meaning that we give things seems real to us. Um, mm. that, is, that is the thing. That is why it's, it's difficult to change a person's mind uh, once they've come, come to a conclusion because yeah. meanings are all-encompassing. 
you know that they yeah. they give you this is the trouble with language itself it, it, our whole being is so uh, embedded <laughs> oh, in the fact oh. that that, well, that we have language language but language isn't that so glorious as well yeah. we're totally going off on one <laughs> there's a there's a, there's a, a russian woman and i'm ashamed to say i don't remember her name she is a professor of linguistics hmm. and uh, she did some phenomenal research about 10 years ago um where because uh, she is used in legal situations because she speaks god knows how many languages so she's brought into legal situations uh really so that she can translate for people and uh, and she realized uh at one point i i think that there was a car um you know people were in court contesting a car accident and uh, and she realized that uh, that if you take uh you know English, that you know, we use oh, syntax yes. in a very specific way. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but if you take Spanish, uh, now Spanish uses, but apart from the fact that you have genders that you don't have in in English, so you've got uh, masculine, feminine, and neuter, neutral, and uh, and she f uh, found that well, linguistically in in Spanish, uh, you you wouldn't say. Uh, I drove the car into the lamppost or he drove the car into the lamppost, you'd say the car drove into the lamppost. And, and the thing is that because of the way we interpret things through linguistics, mm. then this raises a whole question of culpability. Uh, it means that you're, you're actually blaming the thing rather than saying that this person was responsible. Mm. And, uh, and so she took this research, uh, all around the world, she set up a series of questions. And the most alarming one of all, was she had three photographs, one was a man running towards a football. Uh, then there was one of the man's foot actually making contact with the ball. And then the third picture was the ball flying away into the into the distance. And, uh, and she just took these three photographs around the world and asked people to uh, tell me what you see. And uh, and so, you know, we would say the man's running towards the football, the man's kicked the ball and the ball's flying away in the, you know. Um, but uh, she got to Polynesia and I can't remember which specific language, or, you know, that, uh, that they were dealing with. But she showed these people the, the, the photographs and they said, uh, said, yep, yeah, man kick ball. Uh, and she said, what about this one? And they said, yep, yeah, man kick ball. And she said, OK, what about this one? She said, man kick ball. Um, and uh, and she said, yeah, okay, well, what's the difference between? So there isn't any difference, man, man, kickball, um, and uh, uh, ee, mm. you know, language is so integral to the way we experience the world, and it's uh, it's no wonder that we have these ridiculous global situations with cultures not uh, not dealing with each other, when <laughs> language can give you such different impressions of uh, the world around us. Matt, mm. that wasn't the answer you were expecting. Probably. Yeah, sorry, Matt. No, it's, <laughs> sorry, no, don't apologise. I think it's uh, it, it, it's great. This is the thing about there's something so open about asking questions about prehistory. Because, <laughs> what have you well, seen? Wildflowers just uh, put a good one there. She said yeah, in German. You say I have a flat a flat tire, not my car's got a flat tire. Yes, it's a very good example. <laughs> yeah, uh, holy. no, that mm. was uh, unexpected, uh, Matt. But I think this is a th th why I think I'm glad that we're you know we do prehistory because it, it does lead to these open ended questions about the the nature of you know, what human beings get up to and how, how they function, uh, yes. which is, it is different to examining history where you, you're, you're skewed by the people that wrote it. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, and, and you, you get know. bogged down in detail because yeah. now you have to remember names and dates and what mm -hmm. have you, and it completely diverts you from the things that actually matter. You know, yeah. I also think that, uh, that, uh, you and I, obviously, I'm talking about me and Michael here. Uh, but we, because of different things that we do, uh, we research 
uh, by default, we research so many different aspects of, uh, of, you know, whether it's what it is to be human, or, uh, you know, for me, the natural world and stuff like that. And so we, you know, we kind of bring all this uh, research into the melting pot. And I think that gives us a different perspective sometimes. Um, mm. yeah, 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 I'll shut up. Very good. We should write a book. <laughs> John Brooker, that name rings a bell. Hello, Didn't John. Didn't you answer, ask a question a bit earlier? Nice one. Actually, there's a question before last, but you snuck another one in. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> John asks, uh, T-shaped standing stones at Gobe Gobekli Tepe, etc. Could they be representations of gods? They need hands and arms to be manipulative of us mere mortals and throwing thunderbolts about. But if you've no idea what they looked like, why not just leave them as a hint of a being by suggesting it has a head? It has a head. It seems to be a common perception that the top is a head because of the hands on one side. Uh, should we just paint a little bit of pic picture in case nobody's looked uh, or some have not looked at pictures of uh, the T-shaped pillars at Gobekli Tepe uh, recently. Uh, we, we have the advantage there. And, and just as a kind of uh, reminder, should have a photograph somewhere, but it shouldn't be easy. Uh, hard uh, what, to do. Mike's joking, we are writing. Sorry? <laughs> No wildflowers said yes, right. And I'm saying we are, <laughs> we are. It's just, uh, it's just in the background. <laughs> we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Um, no, uh, the the T shaped standing stones at Gobekli Tepe. Um, well, the the trouble for me is in the first sentence of your question there, uh, John, is that the T shaped uh, pillars at Gobekli Tepe um, don't really classify as standing stones because they're not freestanding in the way we tend to envision them or they tend to be represented in uh, photography and, uh, 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 and, and other reproductions, representations of, of them. So uh, because they've always been represented as, as freestanding, uh, and because they occur as freestanding now ish uh, uh, in, in in the landscape, it's assumed that they are standing stones. Um, but it seems that they are they are not. Um, they would have been uh, uh, supports for whatever roof the building had or buildings uh, had. Because um, not only do these T-shaped um, pillars, uh, I mean they're all sizes. Um, not only in the central buildings at Gebekli Tepe, but also in the domestic buildings around. It seems, mm. you know, serving that same purpose of, of, of uh, supporting a, a timber for the uh, for the roof or whatever it uh, it was. Um, so th they could be. I mean, that being the case, I mean, I, I think I, I see the logic. You know, once you've got them set in your mind as a standing stone that happens to have, and they are, uh, what, 10, 11,000 years old, predating, you know, all our monolithic, uh, megalithic uh, stuff by such a, a long time, yeah. uh, and displaying all this sophisticated uh, bas-relief carving of animals and of uh, hands, feet, belts, um, uh, and other paraphernalia, uh, it is tempting to see them put up as representations of gods. I see it the other way around. They uh, were functional as supports. And once you've got a plain surface inside a building, why not decorate it? Yeah. That's, you know, with whatever, you know, is important to you uh, right then. Uh, mm. it, it, it sort of repurposes, and we we do it all the time. You know, we we still decorate stuff. We in, we decorate our interiors, and we give different characters to certainly to supporting things. Anybody been to uh, the Templar Church up in um, Scotland? What is it? I forgot the name of it. What Rosslyn? Rosslyn Chapel. Yeah, the pillars in Rosslyn Chapel. It's, it's crazy. 
yeah. the, the the way that they've been uh, carved and uh, etc. And even if it's just a case of, of simple fluting or what have you, there's a beautiful mm. church uh, not far away from uh, where I am now, uh, Burton Dasset Church. Um, and the same is with so many churches up and down the country. You, very rare to have a, a plain pillar, you know, from the medieval uh, ages. Um, mostly because sorry, the, Matt's just rocked up now. We've answered your question, Matt. Catch up, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> You'll love it, Matt. You'll um, absolutely love it. Um, it. Also worth pointing out, back to Beckley, uh, Tepper, that um, uh, where I had no idea about this until we spoke to Lee Clare mm. um, the other week, um, that there are other contemporary structures that have been found more recently. Uh, and they have very good representations of the human head in them. Mm. So the simple fact about Gebekli Tepe is that they didn't put human heads on because they didn't want to. That was <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah. They were perfectly capable. They just didn't need them or want them in that context. So you, you know, explain that in any way you like. Um, um yeah i mean the the t pillars were performing a function uh that is their shape different people may have done it a different uh, way um but it kind of makes sense to me because there is the uh, keying on on the top the the, the cu um not carving but uh, you know, little the, cut marks the, yeah little for... cut marks and stuff which mm. seemed uh, to me to be a a key for whatever mortar was um, embedded uh, timbers uh, would have been or cross pieces to support you know what would necessarily be quite a large span uh, in yeah. some of the larger buildings you know there are eight of them at Gobekli Tepe um, that constitute um, the particular communal buildings in the middle um, uh, yeah so that is the thing <laughs> why absolutely they would have been covered um it, yeah. it, it, that that to me uh, makes sense and it is the conclusion that uh, um the, the archaeologists on the ground right now are are coming to they are rather turning around from some of the declarations that uh, uh is it hans schmidt um yeah well, he's dead now he, isn't he? He, um, he died yes yeah um so yeah mm. and Here's the thing. Uh, hopefully, we will be getting to Gebekli Tepe and all that. As we mentioned before in uh, answer to an earlier question about going to Anatolia, uh, having yes. made contact with uh, Lee Clare, we, we've, we've got an in to going there and, and, and filming there and, and, and standing with those stones and being able to yeah. report directly back, you know, so... What's going well, he he's keen for us there. to go over yeah, there, yeah. so uh, you know it, yeah, it'll definitely happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. I think that's a, uh, that's all I can I can I've got for that, uh, Rupert. There's nothing. Yeah, I think so. There. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. All right. Let's take moving on. Thank you, Pat, John. Thank you very much indeed for your two questions, um, Pat um, Pat Davies. Following <laughs> following your recent Monday moot. Have you got any more detailed information on any of the roundels in the Czech Republic? For those uh, watching, uh, listening, that uh, are not already uh, on our um, one of our patron Patreon supporters, uh, a Monday moot is something exclusive to our Patreon folk and something we do every Monday, or at least it comes out on. on Hence uh, the name. Every... Huh? Hence the name. Hence the name, the Monday Moot, yes. Uh, in which Rupert and I spend 10, 15 minutes talking about anything. <laughs> yeah. It's Any one whatever of these answers seems to could be, have been a Monday Moot, couldn't yeah, they? Yeah, <laughs> whatever seems to be troubling us at the time. What? Um. <laughs> troubling us at the time. Yeah. And it was a couple mm. of moots ago. Uh, we were talking about uh, the links between... Oh, no, no, it wasn't about that, was it? Um, I'm, uh, we're talking about um, the ubiquity of uh, of the hengiform structures 
across uh, um, yeah Europe. we were talking about the fact that uh, that it, it's amazing how there is this perception that henges are a quintessentially British phenomenon yeah. when it's simply because elsewhere they don't call them henges <laughs> yeah. um, so you'll have hengy form which is the term they use hengy yeah. form structures but things that have ditches and banks anyway uh, and they're called different things in different places. And in Eastern Europe, uh, and well, Central to Eastern Europe, they call them rondels and roundels. And in uh, the Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, hmm. uh, rondels and roundels are all over the place. In fact, I'm, I'm reading a book at the moment, um, which ironically is I, I bought it because I thought I needed to understand more on the uh, the big man theory. And uh, uh, for those of you that might not know about that, it's it's how is society structured? You know, is society structured by a ruling uh, elite, so chieftain? Or is it more of an egalitarian society where you've got the person that everybody respects that they look up to? So there is a sort of guidance, if you like, in the big man, but uh, but not a ruler as such. It's just a more egalitarian society. That's what the book is about, except that it was only when I got the book that I realized it says big men or chiefs. The rondel builders of Neolithic Europe. Well, what do you know? Um, and... <laughs> Bonus. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and the thing is, it's something that, you know, Mike and I have been researching a lot because that is one of the fundamentals of, uh, of what we're writing about in the background. And uh, I'm trying to find you a suitable page here. Um, so these, for example, hold on a second. Um, I'm going to have to stand up because otherwise I'm, I'm going to give you the I'm whole screen. You. Hold on a second. Hold on. <laughs> oh my God! Yes, um, there you are. So, so that illustration there, uh, that gives you some of the different forms of the numbers of ditches and and banks. Uh, here, he said, going the wrong way. This is artists' impressions of uh, of. You know, from the excavations of how they think. I'm sorry, I'm really doing this badly because I can't see what I'm doing. Not, um, do, not doing too badly so far. So you get the idea there of how the yeah. ditches and banks it, and uh, inner palisades it. as well, and uh, yeah, uh, and dwellings. Um, and then hold on a second. There's another one here. This is actually a scale model. Um, uh, yeah. So you can see the way the uh, the ditches. I mean, it, it almost looks as if they're irrigation ditches, or you know, God knows what they were for. Yeah. But um, uh, so you know, the the the, uh, the rondels <clears throat> because of what the archaeology has rendered in Eastern Europe. Uh, you get a very, very clear sense of these structures of being utterly practical. Mm. Uh, whereas in Britain, we have this obsession with, <laughs> with saying, oh, temple. Um, it's quite perplexing uh, how we, we really lapse to that every single time. Mm. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you, uh, you saw the... Uh, uh, the news flash that we did comparatively recently where we talked about uh, the shell rings that had been found in oh, yes. Florida. Yeah. And, uh, and what was so fascinating there is that they're, they're pretty much underwater now. They're, they're not easy to see. Um, when they were put up in however many thousand years ago, uh, when they were constructed, that was dry land. Um, and uh, and what's uh, so fascinating there is that they're in America. Now, the archaeologists' interpretation in America is that these are trading places, mm. whereas you know they're, they're they're circles. If they'd been found in Britain, it would be it's another ritual center. Um, it's 
you know, oh, honestly, uh, it, uh, I don't know why the Brits have such a problem with practicality. Yeah, because it's it's it is curious because basically we are very practical most of the time. Uh, 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 Francis says shell rings in South Carolina. Mm. Um, uh, indeed, uh, in fact, they've um, uh, because um, am I getting them uh, modelled up? They've actually found lots, haven't they? There's a hundred or so they've uh, they've found. Um, yes, no, not in this particular. The the, the article was about the, uh, just a couple, I think, on a particular island. And you're right about it being uh, South Carolina. Uh, yeah, yeah. The article was very specific, I can't, remember, but, I can't um, pinpoint you know where the, this lot were the point about the article was actually not so much about the finding of the you know the shell rings which are you know all over the place but the particular method that they'd used uh applying artificial intelligence uh to lidar scans uh to spot things coming out of uh, the landscape that the human eye might pros possibly miss so yeah. it's uh, machine learning and artificial intelli intelligence applied to uh, lidar uh, data, uh, extract uh, finding these things. These are, in, put it another way: these were not found by humans. <laughs> no, it's a, it's amazing. They were found um, by machine. <laughs> it it is amazing how uh, you know the fact that they're using AI to uh, to do this because. We're just not good enough at it. Um, I, <laughs> I do find that quite interesting. Um, but yeah, we were. I'm just looking for the name of the island. Um, it was Dawes Island. Well done. Uh, in South Carolina. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. What was the question? <laughs> oh, I've forgotten. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well done, Francis. We were talking about South Carolina. Uh, detailed information on any of the Randalls in the Czech Republic. I think it, the, the the thing is to say, Rupert, uh, just mention numbers. There was a map, actually, on one of the pages that you were showing that give, yeah. may give people a sort of a, an idea about uh, just how many of these places that there are. Well, all over uh, the place. If I just give you, hold on a second, while I just try to. And that's not to say the... that we don't have lots. I think you know, we, we do have a heck of a lot of henges, but they they've so been ploughed over. You know, they mm. keep being discovered, and uh, in, uh, lidar and uh, aerial photography is playing a, a large part. So this is. Um, I'm actually trying to get a, a something that shows you geographically what we're looking at because oh, it's difficult to. Uh, uh, there's very little context in some of those drawings. Yeah, there, exactly. Yeah. This um, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. So this top map here, uh, all those spots are rondels. This line here i think it's that one is it the danube no, the, the, this one here is the danube yeah okay so it gives you a sense but you know that's a lot of sites yeah and that's quite a small yeah. area really relatively yeah. speaking yeah in terms of uh, uh, europe so uh, that that yeah. legend is uh um the different groupings, so they're all rondels, mm, but mm. some of them relate to the Lengiel culture, some of them are the Moravian Austrian painted ware group. Mm. There's the Grubgata, I don't know who that is, culture. We're South listening East to your armpit at the moment, uh, Rupert. You're listening to my armpit? Yeah. I have a very, very musical armpit. Um, stroke pottery culture. So there's lots of different cultures who are using the same. Yeah. Uh, you know, building techniques anyway. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, what, what's interesting, not, you're seeing there's... those illustrations, uh, though, Rupert, it is the similarity in design. You know, it's the multiple, yeah. you know, single, double, whatever, triple, uh, bank and ditch, but also these the uprights and the horizontals, mm. you know, the, the, the palisading in bit of it. The wood, in other words, the bit that I always, from mm. when we started making Standing With Stones 15 years ago, I was saying, you, you, if people start finding the wood, then we'll begin to understand these places. Stone yeah. alone just doesn't uh, do it. Yeah. Mm. Cool. We'll get there. We'll get there. I have to say uh, thank you, Wildflower, for your encouragement and... Uh, uh, and uh, <laughs> Yes, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Getting people to because because you were it worked when you when you posted that only eighty four thumbs up and suddenly there were there were three I saw them go up. Good work, <laughs> Wildflower. Thank you very much indeed. And actually, I tell you what, one hundred and forty five viewers and only eighty four thumbs up. Um, that's actually pretty good going. In it's not way, yeah, It's amazing how, so, uh, how, how people just don't <laughs> often yeah. Um, Bless you all, yeah. Mm. By the way, uh, uh, while we're talking sort of off topic a, a, a little bit, anybody that's not already, a, you know, maybe interested in supporting what we do, have a look down in the in the description. There's a link to uh, uh, our Patreon page. Have a look, see if uh, anything that tickles your yeah. fancy there. Do you know what? Something that uh, that only dawned on uh, on me the other day was that. Yeah, as a patron, you get perks, obviously, um, uh, and uh, so there's there's things like the dedicated shows that we do. But yeah. there are certain levels of uh, of patronage where you get stuff like whether it's a prehistory guy's mug or a prehistory guy's hoodie and things like that. And it struck me the other day that well, we haven't got those. <laughs> <laughs> we, we should probably do something about that. Yeah, and so and where want them. one of these. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, know where to go. Anyway, yeah, we next time, that. next time. New year. <laughs> yeah. Hey, by gum. Oh, it's your find a way of getting prehistory guys' badges out to people. It just is such a on top of everything else doing the uh fulfillment of them. I, I need a yeah. third party fulfillment on that to make sense. Anyway, sorry, it, digressing. That's all right. It's just it's it's amazing how hard it is sometimes to find enough hours in the day. Third day. Let us not uh, moan one moment. Um, right, Will, Bick, <laughs> Andy. Well done. Good. Uh, um, if it's true that many dry stone walls were originally built in prehistoric times, might it be reasonable to suggest mm. that they constitute the most numerous surviving prehistoric structures? I appreciate that walls are not quite as sexy a topic as stone circles, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Thanks for the question. It was a bit more elaborate than that, but I think I picked out the, mm. the, the meat of your question there. I, I, I think they are quite sexy, actually. I, I think that uh, anything that you can put your finger on that goes that far into the past, oh, honestly, uh, I, I don't... Uh, I don't think you're right when you say that um, you know they could be the most numerous surviving prehistoric structures because we do know that countless thousands. I'm thinking, you know, Derbyshire is in Britain. Derbyshire is one of the most ridiculous places for dry stone walls, uh, where you have these fields that are tiny enclosures, partly because, well, in fact, largely because of farming techniques. But I, I also do wonder when you get up into the north of England where whether the uh, it was weather conditions that made people decide to uh, put the walls so close together because it would mean that you'd have more control over smaller areas, I think. I don't know. But anyway, the thing is that we know that those walls are comparatively modern. So I'm talking about centuries old rather than anything else. Mm. Uh, but we do know about, uh, I mean, uh, our down in Cornwall and certainly on Dartmoor. Um, in fact, I'm thinking of shovel down in particular on Dartmoor. There are uh, Neolithic walls uh, on uh, on Dartmoor. The, the, the trouble is that when they're that old, they are just so 
sunk into the ground. I mean, you can see them. You can see that they're there as, uh, you know, as boundaries of some description. But it's just the accumulation of soil over the thousands of years means that they don't stand proud as a more modern dry stone wall. Mm. Nevertheless, they are there. Um, there was a, a, an article very recently, not about dry stone walls, but again in Cornwall, that uh, they found that some hedges actually date back to the Bronze Age. Now, I confess that I haven't. Earlier, yeah. Yeah, I confess I haven't read that research. I, I only saw a, a, a press article about it. Uh, so I do need to read that research. But um, but the fact that you could keep hedges going for that length of time, and yeah, absolutely, why not? You know, if things are properly managed, then there's no reason why not. Um, uh, because, yeah, I mean, pollarding, you can keep pollarding going for centuries. And in fact, people do. So I don't see any reason why hedges should be any different if they're properly managed. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I I find that kind of thing quite intoxicating when you think that even now there's, uh, you know, when you have something that still functions today that you know has its roots that far back in the past. Um, I, I just, I love that. I think it's quite magical. Yeah, there's so many mm. aspects to this as well. I mean, uh, ancient walling, uh, you know, if it interferes with uh, more recent farming, then they'd be the first thing to go. I think because we have a, for whatever reasons, have a, a natural reverence for stone circles and things that maybe they got left alone you know the uh, farmers have been less yeah um inclined to clear those from their land just in case but a, a stone wall that's another farmer fair, fair doing yeah. a different purpose now so they'd be the you know f first thing to go Is it, but it's interesting that um you know field systems neolithic field system systems are quite ubiquitous in in ireland as far as i know yeah. um are very near to uh Kalanish in a study area just south of the stones they found a neolithic and bronze age um stone walling uh and stuff and there's you know there's probably a lot more to be discovered the trouble is with dartmoor i think they have trouble distinguishing between uh, the later bronze age uh, stone walling and maybe that which was mm. uh uh, neolithic uh, dating True. is a problem. Well, you probably do good dating on on, uh, on Dartmoor, but of course it's destructive, and you have to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we should um, uh, we, uh, we should uh, go and uh, spend a day on the moor with Lee. Oh crikey, I'm having an, another senior moment now. So it's Lee Clare in uh, in Turkey, yeah. in Istanbul. And and it's Lee who on Dartmoor, because you told the the folk yeah. that yeah that uh, I did. It was Lee I had another moment. senior moment. Yeah, uh, Lee, Lee um, I'll find out for you if you like. <laughs> I, do you know what? I hate it when my head does this. Um, but uh, he'd take us. He he would know exactly. Uh, we could uh, we could have a good uh, day with Neolithic and Bronze Age uh, walls on the moor. Uh, Chubby said, "Getting rocks off your field." I don't know if we, uh, we we must have told this story before, but one of the things that really tickled us when we were filming in the Lake District, we got chatting with a farmer, and uh, he he told us about the time that. Uh, there were a, whole, a, a bunch of archaeologists who were really excited in one of his fields looking at uh, what they thought was a cairn that wasn't marked on the map. And he, he said that was just, he'd just been clearing the rocks off the field and he'd put them in a big pile. And we said, oh, did you tell him? He said, no, let him go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's probably a cairn marked on a map somewhere that's just this farmer's uh, personal field clearance. Yeah. Well, here, here's, a, I mean, you know what I said earlier about, uh, you know, farmers. Lee Bray, thank you, Reese. Lee Bray, excellent. Um, being farmers, being reluctant, maybe to clear uh, stone circles off off the land, um, that certainly didn't save one near um, Druid's uh, Mitchell's Fold, because there's a stone circle up with the view 
uh, in a, uh, over into Wales from uh, Shropshire, uh, up on, on the hill there. And um, th there was supposed to have been a stone circle uh, down the road, l lower down uh, in the field, quite up to relatively recently. And uh, there's nothing there, nothing there. It's just in a bend of the road, it would have been. And I walked up um, past there because I was filming, because I wanted to go up to the axe, supposed uh, axe factory that's up the um, hill uh, in view of uh, Mitchell's Fold there. I swear, <laughs> going past the uh, field walls there, I was thinking, oh, that looks like it belongs in a stone circle. That really doesn't... that. <laughs> I worry about that, where the, the provenance of that stone in that wall. Yeah. And we, we've remarked on that more than a few times, haven't we? Mm. You know, we don't know, but <laughs> you think... Um, uh, that that large stone, the work had already been done for you, finding that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, not far from me, actually, there's a, a little hamlet called Massac. Uh, 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 there's, there's a couple of farms, and that's about it, really. Um, a tiny little village, but uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's, you know, there's a Neolithic settlement there, and some you know dolmens and you know odds and sods but all unexcavated so it's a right mess in the landscape but uh, but they are there and if you go walking through there's a patch where uh, there's some ruined farm buildings so the buildings themselves are probably i don't know 150 years old something like that but there's one of them in particular that uh, it's uh, it's got three walls remaining and the back wall of it is basically one enormous stone <laughs> with some other stones kind of built on top of it. But it's this huge thing that was clearly just one of the ones that was taken from the uh, uh, from the settlement area. Maybe it's a capstone from one of the uh, dolmens or something. Huge stone it is anyway, and they've just made it the back wall of the house. You know, it's like, why try to balance all this stuff together when you can just put one in? Yeah. Much more sensible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, Andy. Yeah, Mitchell's fold was certainly associated <laughs> with the uh, uh, the stone axe source up the. I've got what's the name of the hill? Uh, I've got Crickley Hill. That's not it. That's down in the Cotswolds. Um, I climbed up it, nearly broke myself. Um, <laughs> can't remember. No, yeah, good there point. is some debate uh, in the chat as to Go on. as to whether red wine is going to assist our memories or not. Um, <laughs> it seems that I'm on the wine and Michael isn't, and we're both know. forgetting things, so that's uh, inconclusive. No, I, um, think, uh, I think. The, what was uh, the name of that hill? I can't remember either. You went up it. I didn't. I don't, yeah, I think it begins with C, which is why I'm confusing it with Crickley. But uh, uh, yeah. <sighs> I'm not. I'm not going to uh, strain my mm. brain. Anyway, next question. I think, don't you? Yes. Last question, in fact, from uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Lawrence. What are the, oh. some of the most intriguing signs of time measurement, small or monumental, from prehistory? Seems until recently we've, we've struggled with the tension between lunar months and the solar year. Do we see this played out in prehistory? Um, Corndon Hill. Thank you, Handy. Corndon Hill. So I was right about the sea. Thanks. Excellent. You job. were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spectacular views up there. Wonderful, wonderful. Well worth the climb, it was. Uh, anyway, sorry, uh, back to uh, Benjamin. That's all right. I, I don't know where to go with this, really, other than back to Vince Gaffney. Well, uh, well, exactly, because there are two, two parts to the question. What are some of the most intriguing signs of time measurement, small or monumental, from prehistory? Uh, most mm. intriguing, you know, well, we answered this from a personal point of view, and uh, I will, I think we both say uh, Warren Fields. Mm. What? Warren Fields? We hear you say, yes, we're Warren Fields. Uh, intriguing because um, we're talking about something that dates to the Mesolithic. 
Mm. Um, uh, before, so we're, uh, we suppose we're talking about people what were uh, still hunter gathering for a profession, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's by way of subsistence. Uh, yeah, you know, all that's left of Warren Fields now. I mean, it was discovered because of these pits. Yeah, so, say, say where um, it is it's up in Aberde Aberdeenshire, I do believe. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it's South Aberdeenshire, isn't it? Because um, yeah. I have a mental image in my head of the recumbents being further north. Yes. Um, but uh, but the interpretation of the positioning of these massive posts is that it's a calendar. Yeah. Um, so it, when we're talking the, about massive posts, we're talking about posts from sub one meter across right to two meters across so we're not talking yeah. about you know big trees big something uh, uh in not an alignment but in a curve yeah in a curve uh, yeah so ca carry on where are you uh, going rupert uh, well you've said it really i mean that's the thing mm. the only thing that makes sense of that uh configuration is that it was a calendar mm. Uh, and as Mike yeah, said, it you know, given it's, the it's, landscape it's, it's, that it's in, apparently, yeah, yeah it's Mesolithic. You know, it's like eight thousand years old. And mm. um, uh, <laughs> okay, well, I find that um, uh, intriguing because we don't know anything about those people mm. at all, mm. nothing. Um, so the fact that they put this site together. Uh, you know, it's not something that you, you couldn't do it with a small family group, <laughs> put it that way. Uh, you're talking about, you know, even if you didn't you bother to cut them post, tall, post, what, uh, you, if you've got a two metre wide oak tree, um, uh, number one, cutting it down, number two, cutting it up. Mm. Um, I do think it's funny that when a tree is standing, you cut it down. And when yeah. it's down, you cut it up. Uh. Um, Ba boom it's true though isn't it anyway mm -hmm. um uh actually yeah, i mean i'm sure any number of you would have picked up largish pieces of wood can you imagine how many tons they would have weighed <laughs> so you're not going to do that with mum dad and three of the kids mm -hmm. um you know that that's a sizable group of people um and there's no sign, as far as I remember, there's no sign of any settlement uh, nearby, is there? It's, uh, so. it's not like so. Star Car, for example, no, where no, we know that that no. was a fat settlement. Um, so, yeah, very intriguing. They were doing something that was clearly very sophisticated, but we don't know who they were and what else they were doing. No yeah. idea at all. So as Mr. Vince Gaffney turned out to be Mr. Ubiquitous tonight, three times yes, he landed yes, on, yeah. in his, in his. Yeah, we like Vince. Yeah, yeah, uh, he's, um, he's a great raconteur. He'll tell you a story but, or two. Seek yes. out our interview oh, with him. Yeah, oh, he tells some down funny down stories. Down. Yeah. Funny stories, um, but uh, I, I mean that. To, I think to us that is the most enigmatic. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that you know if you if you start talking about solar alignments, uh, you know, so take the Claver Cairns or Newgrange or you know whatever you like, where the uh, you know at winter solstice the sunrise shines up the passageway, that kind of thing. I don't find that enigmatic. Damn clever, but I don't find it enigmatic. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, Warren Fields, I can't think of anything else that's drastically enigmatic apart from, you know, maybe the, uh, uh the 99, uh, style well, circles yeah, that have I mean, to relate to cycles. Everything's yeah. intriguing in this regard in that it mm. leaves so many unanswered questions. And I suppose, you mm. know, as I was saying to you earlier, Rupert, the unanswered question is the origin of, uh, you know, how long that had been going on. Uh, mm. the alignment because the early, uh, earlier things that display uh, solar alignment are of course the you know barrows you know the the, the chambered tombs such as Newgrange and uh, Brinkethley the and Mays Howe uh, and and any other number of long barrows and things which of course are, are relatively early and uh, spring you know the, the genesis is from stuff just over the channel in Brittany. 
um, the question in my mind is, well, okay, I know about Gavrinus and I know that's aligned, but I can't think of, and Gavrinus is relatively late in the sort of, uh, in, in the line of things, uh, you know, stuff going on in Brittany for, you know, a long time. So I'm just wondering how far that goes back uh, mm. uh, as a tradition. Um, mm. But, you know, we've, we've got some points coming up in mm. the chat. I mean, you know, uh, Ralph uh, says, and it's a very good point, uh, although, you know, Noah, yeah, we can ta take or leave the interpretations of Noah. It's a good point, though. The reason for Noah being 900 years old is that uh, Amanetha says uh, the Egyptians used lunar years, not solar years, yeah. so you have to divide by 13 to get normal solar years. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, when it comes to ages of people, I think we can take that with a pinch of salt because uh, we're basing those on very bad translations in the first place. Um, yeah. But certainly when it comes to cultures using lunar years as opposed to solar years, you know, that's it's a very good point. Yeah. Um, uh, right, uh, Benjamin talks about a, a, a tension between the lunar months and the, and, and the solar year. Yeah. Uh, maybe... It, the only place that really plays out is at Stonehenge. You know, that we know that the same thing, that these two things yeah, are going on at the same site. Uh, yeah. The station stones are, um, are supposed to be uh, relative to uh, the comings and goings of the moon. And of course, mm. you know, the, the basic alignment of Stonehenge is, to, is a solar uh, alignment. But as for the tension... It's probably something that occurs in the minds of us trying to work things out <laughs> rather more than <laughs> yeah. uh, in the uh, minds yeah. of the people that were constructing these things. <laughs> uh, well, there's a nice stat from Spike. One metre square of oak weighs around 1.5 tonne. Wow. Yeah. We underestimate the weight of... Uh, the weight yeah. would huge, don't we? Uh, one of the things that I hate about, um, no, I don't hate it, I just, uh, it's, I prefer not to have to. I live in a part of the world where uh, log fires are the only way, sadly. Um, but all oh, sustainable woodland, so it's, you know, it's not catastrophic, it's just not preferable. Um, but I, uh, I buy my wood. Uh, by the stair, which is a square meter. And uh, so when I get them uh, delivered here, because I own a lot of woodland, but I'm damned if I'm cutting my own woodland down to burn it. Uh, you know, I have a lot of wildlife here. They live here. Uh, they lived here before I did. So, so I won't cut my own trees down other than for the health of the forest. Um, but so they deliver like six tons at a time. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I know what wood feels like, uh, and I don't pick up big pieces, so I can't imagine, you know, picking up a log. Can yeah. you imagine two yeah. meter wide? Yeah. Do you know what? You see, to us, you know, we don't lug large lumps of wood around, even. <laughs> but to people that had already been felling trees and lugging those around. Bit of stone doesn't won't seem that much more of a reach. No, interesting. No. If you're if you're adept at handling those kinds of weights anyway, it's probably <laughs> not that much of a reach to start picking up stones by the same. Mm. Yeah, whatever. Well, that has brought us uh, to the end of our questions and uh, mm. uh, the end of the evening. Um, uh, it's been great as ever, uh, folks. Thank you for your good uh, good kind heartedness and uh, you know, playing nicely with each other and uh, and for your fantastic questions and suggestions and for keeping us mm. on our toes as ever so uh, brilliant this is the last time we'll be doing a live thing unless you know, we've got surprises up our sleeve i don't think we have right till now the, till the till new year, year. I mean, you know, how yeah. the hell yeah, did that happen i don't know oh, i don't know yeah. what's happened to this year really it's um mm -hmm been a funny one um yeah. say but the, the uh, least. anyway <laughs> we're looking forward to constructing uh what happens next uh with your help mm. folks and uh, and your input and uh, uh your goodwill um thanks um 
I don't think there's anything more to add to uh, that tonight, uh, as ever. Uh, uh, no, thank you for your input. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for your support. And uh, and we will see you all very soon. <laughs> nice one, folks. <laughs> Ta-ra for now. Take good care. See ya. Right.